So his capturing the cities, the subtleties of the color, and his sensitivity to the tones is more what it's about. It's almost like a symphony. It's musical. Ivan's art speaks to you. When you look at it, you can see it's living, it's different, you know? And it, it's giving you a message. But sometimes you look at art and it's just paint on paper. It was different. When you look around and take a look at what is the, what is the landscape for local artists, and then the landscape for local black artists um, at that point in time um, is perhaps celebrated as one of the more talented, um, intuitively trained artists on the island. This year's Ivan Payne Award goes to Jefferson Folks. Suffice to say that the, the Ivan Payne Award of Excellence speaks to his character as a person, to have his name there for someone to be the beneficiary of an award, yes, yeah, speaks to his character as a person. So 1920s going into the 1930s, you've got to think of Barbados as going through a great economic lull. Um, there has been a, a lot of depression. There's not much money in the sugar market. It's still very much an agrarian society. Persons depend on sugar for survival. At the around the time that he is born, we are maybe a decade past the First World War. We are also four years past when those persons who would have gone to Panama um, to migrate, to make money, to come back home had ended. So it's, it's not an economically vibrant time. So it's really about survival and, and trying the best to actually survive. Many people had two or three jobs. So the person who was a laborer during the sugar crop season out of crop might have been, for the, for the men, might have been a, a fisherman or had learned to trade as an artisan and is going to do that. But come sugar cane season, we'll go to the sugar factory because that's where most of the money is being made. So this, this, is the, this is the area and time that we're looking at um, for Ivan. And then born in Spitestown, however, we, we're looking at a Spitestown where a lot of the trade will still have been very much dictated by the sea. Uh, this is the height of the Spike Stone schooners moving people and goods from the north um, to the west into Bridgetown. Um, so that's the, the type of society that he would have lived in. Where beyond Spike Stone as we know it today would have been sugarcane fields and factories. And while he was in school, and his teacher at school was called a gentleman called Banfield. I can't remember his last name. But he, you know, he had this encouraging teacher who helped him a lot and develop, helped develop his walk talent. Walk properly. Don't walk too close. Put your hand on his shoulder and that will show you where you need to be. Good job, Ivan. I think he had to be self-taught. I think he was just gifted. He was natural. When we go to, go to art, I would divide my channel, canvas into a screen or a rectangle and go from there. He didn't do that. But if you put that thing to him, it would work out as if he had done it. He was that good. And the parents, his parents, encouraged him very much in his art. Now, as a former teacher, many parents do not encourage their children, even today, in 2020, um, in pursuing the idea of pursuing a career, an art-related career, because they say, what are you going to do with that? You're not going to make any money, you can't live off of it. For me, one of the most wonderful things about his story is that his father was a baker, which is a creative activity in itself, and he had a bakery in Spikestown, creating different pastries and what have you. And Ivan even went to the extent of experimenting with making colors from flowers. He did that, and only, I think, in about 
1936, he acquired his first set of crayons. So they could only assume access to a primary level education, I think up to about standard seven. So young people left school at 14, 15. Uh, many of them would have gone to, as laborers into the sugar, sugar cane fields. Others would have sought out an apprenticeship to someone. But the, it's just the white people who are into this thing, you know, not the black people. For a start, you can't paint if you ain't got canvas. A canvas was not reasonable. You can't paint if you ain't got brushes. An art among that generation when it comes to working class people, they could not afford it. That was a luxury. So for him to break into the art world, he had to be exceptionally good. He just he painted on everything. There was a table, he talked, there was art on it. Anything that I could get his hand on, he seemed to be. His father being a baker meant that there's a steady income, but still perhaps to, to be deemed to be to be lower class because uh, you don't have a lot of information but at least they would have been a trade they would have been food on the table well i remember that we used to visit him on at a particular time of the year now my parents were members of the brethren the closed brethren church and uh, their custom on bank holidays was to visit particular churches and each year the same church would be visited at the same time and it was around either easter or whitson one of the two that they visited the spikestone branch of the church and during this period my dad would get my mother and my sister and I and take us to visit in Calico. The house he lived in was that narrow passage between Queen Street and Sand Street where the townhouses are and he lived in one of those townhouses that are just on the street in that narrow passage and that's my where I used to visit. My recollection is of a very quiet household, which to me, Ivan was the most lively, and I took to him straight away. So we did strike up a little bit of um, a relationship. From my memory, he was first noted for his carvings. It's his carvings that he showed me first. Um, and I know that one, on one of the visits when all the family were there, which is my family and his family, he brought out carvings from that he had won an exhibition with and showed us. And at the end of all of that, the parents thought, we'll apprentice him to a joiner because it's always useful to have a trade. So he was, and Barbados has a wonderful history which I think it still continues to have, of furniture makers and joiners who do excellent work. And I recognize even before I knew him as a painter, there were four chairs in my dad's home in our home that I knew that I ever had made. And from a boy to a teenager, I had my eyes on those four chairs. I remember saying to my siblings, to my parents today, I don't care about land, I don't care about money. They want those four chairs. I happen to have three pieces by him. But two chairs, a table, and a bed frame. And uh, I, in my mind's eye, I see two carvings of women. One as a morbid seller and one as a seller of fruits. And I don't know if that's my imagination or if that's for real, but that's something that vaguely plays in my mind, that these were the two, two figurines that he got prizes for at an exhibition. Alain Benoit told me a nice story. Ivan 
carved these two figures, which he was using as doorstops, and he gave them to Alambe. So that is part of Alambe's collection today. When I went, he was, he was in the kitchen cooking, and um, he told me, come and talk to him when he was cooking. So when we push open the doors, and I look down on the ground, I see these two stoppers, two, 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 two statues. Those are the statues that he gave me of two Moby women. That is what they were, right? And it was, as he said, he built up, he did them and made them as door stoppers. And when I saw them, and I said, but wait, I didn't know you do scotch. And, you know, one of them things I guess was, because uh, he was a woodworker. Remember, joiner, right? So he got that, and then he said, man, you want them? And he gave them to me. I could only think or suspect that it is from the pieces of mahogany that would left off from the furniture that he was taught to make that he started to be interested in carbon because and probably used his skills from joinery to start the carbon. And I feel that that is probably start, sparked him off in art and because it would appear that he was completely self-taught. Parents would send, especially working class, Parents would send their children to learn to be artisans, masonry, carpentry, joinery, tailoring, that sort of thing. So to have a child now bearing off to do art at a time when you would think he should be earning money because people didn't think there was any money in art or much worth in it at the time, certainly not working class parents. Well, part of his what I suppose would have contributed to his popularity. You're talking about among the West Coast people and others who collected his work. I think it is both the skill that he demonstrated and he also won, he, his work would have been seen at the industrial, annual and industrial exhibition which you must have heard of that took place in Queen's Park every long Christmas, long December. And in that, he won a lot of prizes. I would also think that if a child showed you must talent to start getting prizes and some kind of recognition, then families would probably um, begin to be proud and realize that there is something in this their art. During this time as a young man, he would have met Frank, Calamon, who was the editor of BIM magazine, the writer, and Frank Calamon published some of his work in BIM, but most significantly of all is that he entered his John Harrison of the British Council, because the British Council had an office for the Caribbean base right here in Barbados. And the British Council's purpose was to, remember these are the colonial times, was to spread, what should I say, British cultural norms to the colonies. So an exposure to art, literature, well I suppose film to some extent, and that type of thing. So John Harrison was very helpful to many artists. One of their remits is, is about education and the development of um, the appreciation for, for art, but also the training of artists. I think they also ran training programs um, on, during the day, and them in collaboration with institutions like the museum around the time would have run Sunday workshops to teach people how to draw and how to paint, and also how to take photographs. Um, so it's almost an incubator of sorts for artists. He also was befriended by Neville Connell, who was the director of the Barbados Museum. And Neville Connell was really very supportive. He invited um, Ivan Payne to have his first solo exhibition at the museum in 1952. You know, the trans, where you were, you know, trans, 
form, I cannot change the museum into art gallery. That one was on the first art gallery. So you would hang pictures there, free, but then the point out of there, and you would got to pay to get the picture hung. This was right, but the point is, it opened the avenue to the public. There was this art gallery, which was probably saved and people used to go there. And boy, and people used to exhibit there, including myself. It helped him because a lot of people who didn't know about him got to know, and especially overseas visitors. The overseas visitors were very, they, they loved art and they would always seek to know where a gallery is and the found out that was one, the museum was one. His, his entire, one of his interests was about growing that West Indian appreciation and understanding of what art is and how art could be used to transform a society. Barbadians were invited into the museum not only to view the exhibitions but they did also provide classes and they utilized the museum's um, temporary exhibition galleries to showcase local art and I believe that Mr. Connell would have utilized the Arts Council in order to push that agenda where art was seen as a way by which Barbadians could express themselves and the need then to identify Barbadians for that training. Most of the artists, the group around um, Goldie White that became the Barbados Arts Council ultimately and Kathleen Hawkins and Aileen Hamilton, they were looking at the people and producing a world of their own, but a world through the people and the activities of the people, whereas Ivan Ping, it's the buildings, it's the streets. Look at what he did with the Tuk Ban, look at what he did with the, with the, with the other type of things that represent Barbados uh, 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 and so on. And, and that was, in other words, he captured the lifestyle of the people around him. And that is what he did. And there are a lot more paintings like that, but I don't know where they're going to. Living in Spikestown, which was the biggest town in that area, you were very much, you observe it, it is very much its own world. And when you see those paintings, it looks somehow different from when you see paintings of other people. What I saw were scenes of Barbados, scenes of Spikestown. So, he was recording scenes around him at the time. And I don't think you go out to paint something that you don't like or value. You would paint something that is familiar, something that you really value and like seeing. Spikestown in the 1940s and 50s um, was quite a different spice down from now and the unfortunately we've just lost one of the old buildings but um, the building next to that used to house Marjorie Griffith I remember she was a music teacher it would house the telephone exchange was there um, and also the library was in that building that um, is a three-story building there on the beach side. Um, we also had an old store which is still standing there and he was the main supplier of medicines etc. Noel Roach. Now right next to Noel Roach is a little narrow street called Godin's Alley and next to that was Challoner's Cooper's Yard, and it was there that the molasses was barreled, and you would hear the hammering, the men hammering the barrel. You see what in people that struggle? Because if you look at a lot of his paintings, there's one in Nice Road, I believe it's Nice Road, from a viewpoint of the rectory in Farm Road, 
and you can see channel houses with laundry. You can see persons use like an oil drum that they beat up with oil drum to get PLA, to form PLA for privacy. A lot of them were fishing seas to inspect some going up next to the sea. You can see working people. I don't recall seeing people living in that street in a lizard. All that I can think of, you can see a struggling people, people that can say the working class. I myself, as I probably said already, had to, and I miss, and get it to somebody. I was selling, I was told to sell them. So I have nothing of his, none of his painting. I had a painting called the front door. And I mean, a bedroom, shattered house, front door partly open, I mean, but and a bedroom tree. I mean, it was a real typical bedroom. Where you get here was a man who was in love with the bedroom, and who, without the kind of training you would think about, was able to get things looking right. He entered the Gainsborough Art Competition, which is an international art competition. So in that time, I mean, today, when a Barbadian artist wins an international competition, it's a big deal. So you can imagine what it would have been like at that time, in the 50s, an even bigger deal. And he won an international competition, this Gainsborough competition, which was run by a gallery called Foyles Gallery in London. And in addition to that, a little bit later, he also won the Alcoa. And the Alcoa company, I think, is an oil company based in Trinidad. And they had an art competition. And he won a prize in that. I wouldn't use the term primitive to describe him, or naive painter, because I think the style of his work, naive suggests intuitive and you're not trying to follow a, a traditional form of looking at work and reproducing something that is true to life. The intuitive brings with it something a little bit more uh, unschooled. It's, it's, there's that kind of implication. And the work of the intuitives is just as beautiful, but there's like a greater sensitive, almost you might be familiar with the work of Aboriginal artists. It's, that is the link I can make, where you're not trying to produce something that has a photographic representation. And I wouldn't say that Ivan's really was intuitive. It was different. When he went to art school in Britain, the teacher that he encountered, whose name I do not recall, did observe that he would not describe him as a primitive either but he felt that his style and his approach was governed mostly by the fact that he was in this very, like a, a small world, a narrow world, and he was trying to reproduce that world and the atmosphere of Spikes Town. And I think he succeeds because even when you look at his paintings way back when, and you go into Spikes Town, Spice Stone it is something so very different. The simplicity, which is something I didn't appreciate in the painting he gave to Dad, but which I appreciate now. The simplicity in the lines, and he, for me then, I wondered, why isn't it in brighter colors and what have you? Um, and now I see and appreciate the simplicity and the way he used colors. Um, and there is nothing garish about his paintings. The reason why he went to the UK is because he won, he was awarded through the efforts of the British Council, a scholarship, a fellowship, um, to study art for a period of time. But he's going at a time where there is that migration of West Indians to the UK. But what we've got to remember is that that migration was for two reasons. 
it was help, to help to rebuild post-war Britain, but it was also a migration that was regulated. Now, first of all, he had to be doing very well to have been considered by, by the Arts Council for a scholarship. So clearly, somewhere between leaving school at 14 or 15, recognizing that he does have this talent for art, um, honing by himself um, his art to where he is an intuitive artist, then being noticed enough by the people at the Art Council that they're willing to provide him for scholarship to go to England to study, says that the recognition of a particular talent and the willingness for the talent to learn to be sent. I would say that um, it, his visits to the museums and his awareness of persons who he might have seen simply as jigsaw puzzles or in our history books at the uh, British Council. People like Constable, Gainsborough, and those people in the 16th the 17th century, flower painters and so on. Those persons, I think, would have had an impact on him. I, I do have some flowers. I have a tree with flowers, flower arrangement, a sea, and I, I, I know I had an incomplete one. We have a garden. Ivan could make a subject out of the most trivial thing. He would find, he had a way of painting flowers, capes, that nobody ever rifled, you know. I thought I was wrong, but not rifled. Rivaled, rivaled. Nobody ever painted like I do. I think he's very good at using colors. And the way he, the way he formed his picture too, and even Verti, if you look at even different styles, you, you might be able to look at an artist and you have a particular style, but even a versatile. Even when, if the picture had density, you can see, when you look at that picture, you can see the change in the background, the, the size is different, you can see the density in the picture, so they look, they, they, like I said, they were living. Because when you look at the painting, it looks right or wrong. I mean, regardless of how well it painted, if you have the attention, look at that. What do you think he put that file up there, Benny, down? And that little blossom there? It ain't by, it ain't by chance. Well, I'm still exploring and speculating about that time in the UK. He met his wife. I'm not sure if he met her here or he met her in the UK. They were married in Lancashire, and at least I think they were married in Lancashire. And in Cornwall, there was an artistic community, a colony of artists that had been set up by the artists. And Cornwall would have been something quite different because, of course, it's by the sea. And having this artistic colony there, and these were people who were in some cases doing more abstract work, more adventurous work in the um, 40s, 50s. So I think that would have had an effect on him. And even though he didn't turn to abstraction, but the awareness that these developments were taking place in the visual arts abroad would have been quite exciting for him. So I think that would have had its own impact because um, some landscape paintings that we have seen in the collection of his cousin, Timothy Payne, um, suggest that they might have been done or influenced by his experience in the UK because it's really, for me, quite unusual to see landscapes by Ivan Payne rather than cityscapes. I have a painting that is different to the ones in Marvelous. The houses, the landscape, everything because it, it, it involves a lot of landscape and houses. And this one's different, all the others. Mine is, is not as bright, you know, it has many colors, it's a bit gray, and that, from to my side, to me, this is English, you know? It's sort of, what England is like, well, not that England is gray, dull, but you know, the colors are not that, like, you have a lot of bright colors, or landscape is brighter, and I, I do feel that that one in England. By the time he returns, um, we are swiftly um, going through some momentous changes. 
Uh, by the time we get into the 60s, of course, we are having the discussion about moving towards being independent. But the fact that Ivan himself is commissioned to create an exhibition around the time of independence means that that latent talent that had been observed as a teenager that got awarded with a scholarship is now being able somewhat to make a living out of this talent that he has. But it also, in a way, is a statement of as an island moving into independence, moving into being free of this colonial yoke, we are identifying those people whose talents and artwork are in tune with what we wish to do and who we want to be. After Evan came from England, he was living somewhere in Fitzphillips and James. I think he had a studio, he used to live there for some period of time before he died. The, after coming back, I think people then recognized him because he won an award in England. And in my research and trying to find his art, I met persons, and there are quite a few Barbados who have his art. They would not advertise it. I have seen some, you know, but they would not advertise it and they would not sell it. They would not sell the treasury. Yes, that is how I come to know how I would always go belong to the art. So I was the secretary. So he had to be there regardless of what he was doing. And there were whole exhibitions, you know. And I would always go down there, right? I would whole exhibitions. And if I had a sense I had, no, I would buy one from him. He was a very humble man. He never talked about his work as, as being uh, exciting or anything else like this. He just did it. And, and that, that was who he was. And I remember the first piece I saw since coming back here was a visit to Montrose Fielding Babs House in Christchurch. I was interested in some of his work and I went there um, to see what I could obtain. And uh, I looked upon the wall and there was an Ivan Payne. It was a painting of breadfruit tree leaves shades and light and I looked up and I remember saying to him are you going to part with that thing <laughs> he gave me a flat <laughs> no don't even go there don't think about it I run got me you can't talk anything I run right to England to be able to say he had a British council here and he had a pain met a lady out there. She was a West Indian girl. She used to be a nurse. She trained in England, but they, they married in England, see? And she was proud of the Ivan Payne man, or his fame apparently hit England too, you know? The English are very, very knowledgeable with paintings, you know? They can't go out there with any foolishness. And she married the man, and he, he, she started to slide, slide across the road in the other people's arms. And he was annoyed at it, but he couldn't correct it. So he took this thing, he wouldn't open up to anybody. He, he loved his wife. You can tell that he, he, he was hurt then because of the separation and sometimes people find it hard to let go and apparently he found it hard to let go so his heart went to England but his body was in Barbados and I think that is what really really affected you know and drinking probably see that as a way of relaxing which is not but that's what he told that probably he needed someone then but when you when you when you look to, to such a great artist or person. People tend to think you don't need help. Well, he, he's a genius, he's good. But those are humans too. And they need support, they need love, they need encouragement like anybody else. So he in that position, people just take it for granted, you know. But I think he needed help. He coped with the loss in his way. It affected him that he wouldn't talk to anybody. 
You affect him, you stop painting. You stop painting. And just sat in the chair one day and you get the door. I have to represent the Ivan Payne Award of Excellence. I was incarcerated for a while and I would have seen these guys painting, you know, that's why I got it, Carly Trotman. He actually introduced me to, introduced me to it, yeah? And, um, and I, I always thought, you know, I can, I can do that. But when I got exposed to it, I would always endeavor um, to be, you know, like, uh, uh, when I see artists, I say, I want to be like that artist, I want to be like that artist, you know? And uh, that kind of compelled me. My first award was Sam Six Years and Still Standing. It spoke to um, the, um, the resilience of, uh, of, of, of a lady, uh, which would be like uh, any one of us, uh, grandmother or, or grandmother. I always admired Owen. Arthur, late on, late on Arthur, you know, I, I think Prime Minister. I think he was just an awesome person, you know, and, and I, I, I felt good uh, uh, to be presented with the opportunity to meet him. As a matter of fact, he insisted, he said, um, he insisted, he sent a message and said, no, no officer can come collect this award. I want to meet the inmate of this. And, um, and uh, then they just said, okay, we're well, going to meet the Prime Minister. I said, well, well that is, that's, that's cool. <laughs> that's really cool, you know? So I sent my best click, click suit, you know? And I uh, got myself all sorted out. That took time that I went there. I really look forward to, 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 to going down to El Court and meeting the Prime Minister and receiving my award. And mind you, the Central Bank didn't waste any time at all in buying it. If I knew the Central Bank was going to buy it, there and then, I would have raised the price. <laughs> Fielding looked up to Ivan. He was so impressed and he spoke very highly of Ivan Payne. When I went to his home, he showed me a painting by Ivan Payne, two barefoot leaves. And I looked at it, you know, and he said to me, I would so love to get more Ivan Payne. You know, he thought that he was a very good artist and he had an influence on him too. I think he's who have motivate feeling to persist. That you can't have a future in, in, in painting. He was always willing to help and to teach people. I've learned a lot from him and realized that even though he didn't read about it, it came natural to him. You see, I learned a lot. But then to die that way, lonely sitting in a chair, you know, he wanted to open up. He's got to open up to people, and he didn't open up. You would see a lot of my work in Chatter Houses, uh, local barbing and scenery, sheep up and uh, stamp pipes and that kind of stuff. However, if you looked at my last award, my last Impen award, you would, see, you would notice that it was lifeintransition.com. So you would see the transition of life from the chattel house, and then you gravitate towards the digital world and the digital time. So to the youngsters, you would be more inclined to paint things that are in your time, in the digital time. He must have had a big influence on people in the year when it comes to painting because obviously there were not many role models for those youngsters back then. And having went to England to get that scholarship, so to speak, and winning an award would have influenced his generation or his contemporaries to do painting, so he had to have a big influence. His legacy as a painter, um, his style might speak to some younger painters as to how to use color um, and that color to, to, to express yourself 
you need it doesn't have to be um, you don't have to express what you see in blazing it doesn't have to blaze off the um, canvas that it can also express itself very subtly but that um, whatever it is is there do not wait to be discovered it may never happen but if you take your own initiative and you try to get your work out there you exhibit you have your work be seen into other worlds that you might not socially necessarily be part of people will know you exist and that's what Ivan did you should learn that you should try and also link with people that know sometimes you find you can correct people that know that is how you advise me more need to view his work uh, through the lens of an anti-colonial movement and the lens of both proto and post-independent Barbados and then that slow creation of what national identity is um, especially when it comes to the visual arts um, and that's another lens through which we need to take a look at Ivan's work. We see the Ivan work for me because when I introduced myself as the recipient of the Edmonton Award of Excellence, it, um, you know, that kind of opens up the, the wow factor or uh, awesome, you know, even though people that I say to me not necessarily know him, yeah, but, uh, but, but through the works that they see me produce, they, it's almost like an, uh, uh, they, they, they get to know him, yeah, so he has left the legacy. But his legacy definitely was what he was going to do to your best. And I think he, he followed his passion and did to his best.